All right, gang, I apologize. I've been a little discombobulated this time with chapter six and chapter seven. I just posted chapter six lecture, which I did do a couple of days ago and thought I was going to add some of chapter seven to it, but a few things popped up that kept me from doing that. So I went ahead and got six online. Another thing I'm going to apologize for, I realized as I was getting at home, getting ready for chapter seven, I've been looking at the older edition of the book. So it's possible when I gave you page numbers, look at the chart on such and such a page. I may have been off a little bit. I know in the chapter six, when I just finished it with the organizational chart that showed, um, you know, the chain of command and the span of control and that that chart is actually on page 173 if you bought the book, the most recent edition book. So I apologize. I think I have the right book in front of me now. So hopefully my my references in the future um, will have the right page number on it. All right. So what we're going to do, you, you've had six now. We're going to break seven up. Chapter seven is um, it's one I enjoy because now you're really going to delve into law. You're going to have to study cases, know some cases, what they stood for. So it is um, a good bit of note taking, a good bit of understanding. It's it's a basically a long listing of cases. I mentioned it last time or on the chapter six lecture. I did put a, um, a study guide on the um, the announcement. You probably want to have that printed out so you can fill it out. And that way you'll have a handy dandy little cheat sheet, so to speak, um, to know all these cases and what they stand for. All right. So let's jump into chapter seven. And I'm in my office today. So the lighting may look a little different than the courtroom. The courtroom's pretty dark, but I can spread out a little bit more in here. And I have a lot of um, stuff that I'm looking at as we're talking today. So let me see if I can get the PowerPoint up. All right, so let's see if we can get this thing up here where you can see it. All right, chapter seven, here we go. So chapter seven is um, really about the legal aspects of policing. And one thing that's always blown my mind, especially as I went through law school, is that we're able to teach police officers so much law because they have to understand what they can do, what they can't do. And when we talk about that, we're talking about um, in a couple of different areas. The Bill of Rights is where the basic constitutional protections are found. And those protections are, are designed to avoid these abuses of police power. In other words, we don't want the government to be able to just willy-nilly come into your home, search through your documents, search you, search your car. There are some protections that are built in for standards that have to be met. Um, the constitutional protections are, and, and this is showing you by amendment what some of those are. And I think when you look at some of them, you'll understand, okay, unreasonable searches and seizures, arrest without probable cause. We've heard if you watch any crime shows, you've seen where people plead the fifth, and that's the right to not incriminate myself. Um, when I have protective order court, even though we're in civil court, a lot of times the people have criminal charges involved in whatever incident they had. And I can't make somebody testify in civil court if he's going to incriminate himself in criminal court and he has the right to not incriminate himself. Double jeopardy, meaning you can't try somebody twice for the same thing. Due process, we've talked about that. That's actually in a couple of different amendments. But there you see, these are all constitutional protections of your rights. And, um, and they're found in what we call the Bill of Rights. Now, individual rights, um, it's, it's really basically making sure that all the, the checks and balances are being met. In other words, one branch is always held accountable to other branches. We don't want any individual or any agency to become so powerful that they get to make all the decisions. So just like you learned back in elementary school, you know, the legislative branch is the one that writes the laws, but the judicial branch is the one that's actually interpreting those laws. So they go hand in hand. The executive branch is the other one, and that's the one, for instance, like the president of the United States. We don't want any one person or any one side of this balancing to become too powerful. Although anytime that a person feels like his rights were violated, he does have the right 
to appeal to courts. You, you can file lawsuits and go to court about it. So let's focus, first of all, on the due process requirements. Remember, due process, and some people miss that on the test, but the procedural fairness, that's what we're looking at is due process. That's really found in the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments. What we're going to look at with regard to police and how these things fall within um, their arena is within three major areas, and that's the evidence or investigation, which case-wise we'll refer to as search and seizure. The second area has to do with arrest, and the third area has to do with interrogation. So that's the three areas we're going to start with. We're going to start today on the search and seizure and those cases that have to do with that. Now, when we talk about cases, what do you mean cases? Well, you know, the Constitution um, has broad general language, as do most even state constitutions. It's, it's a matter of, you know, everybody's entitled to due process. Well, what does that mean? We don't really know what that means. So the Supreme Court, who's the ultimate authority on the U.S. Constitution, they look at particular cases that will present a certain set of facts and say whether that is due process or not due process. So they're basically taking these broad generic protections and they're ruling on individual cases. Those are called landmark cases. They're the biggies. They're the ones that set the standards for everybody else to have to follow. And some people say, well, you know, that's the rules of the game. If they address a case where, you know, this certain set of facts and this was the result, well, then everybody out there needs to know, OK, if you have anything close to this certain set of facts, this is going to be the answer. This is how that constitutional protection kicks in. The Fourth Amendment is the one that you're going to see when you read this language, how it has to do with search and seizure. So the right of the people to be secure in their persons, their, their own bodies, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, that all fits on that one screen, but that has a lot of information in it. So first of all, they're telling you this applies to yourself, your house, your stuff, papers and effects, that they cannot come in and do an unreasonable search or seizure. They can't get a warrant to do that search unless there's probable cause where they actually, that police officer is going to sign an oath or an affirmation saying this is what they're going in to look for. This is where they're going to look for it. So that's a lot of different factors built into that Fourth Amendment right there. That just put together a lot of pieces that you're going to see now as we talk about cases. The Supreme Courts, um, it's so important who is on your Supreme Court. And Supreme Courts are often referred to by who is their chief justice. So this gives you an idea of, you know, over history, um, getting us to fairly recently, the Earl Warren Court was first. The Warren, I say first, the first one we're looking at, because remember, the courts weren't really involved in criminal justice prior to this. They barely ever got into criminal justice cases. So once we got into the 60s, though, the Supreme Court did start focusing on individual rights, and that's what the Warren Court was known for. That Warren Court is actually the one that started butting into this arena and saying, we are going to take these cases, we are going to render decisions. And Chief, War Chief Justice Earl Warren was there until 1969, and that is what his court was more known, known for, individual rights. The Warren Burger Court, and again, that's only because Chief Justice the chief justice of this during this time period was Warren Berger and then John Rehnquist. And what happened over time now, by the time we're getting up to Rehnquist, look, that's putting us all the way to 2005. Now we're going to start chipping away at individual rights. And you're going to see in these cases how that is reflected in their decisions. OK, let's start in on the search and seizures. So the first case we're going to look at, and again, this is going to be on your study guide is the Weeks versus U.S. case. And in the Weeks versus U.S. case, now some of these fact stuff, this is 1914. So you got to remember, these are facts that are way different from the life that you and I live today. 
But basically, um, Mr. Weeks um, was selling lottery tickets through the U.S. mail. And that was not that was illegal back then. It didn't work like the lottery you and I think of today. So they the agents didn't get warrants at the time that warrants were not a thing. That wasn't something that they were required to do. Remember, we don't we, in 1914. We're way back now before the Supreme Court was really involved in the criminal justice arena. They didn't get a warrant. They went to Mr. Weeks's home. They seized incriminating evidence and some personal items, all right, clothes, papers, books, things like that. So before um, the trial, his attorney comes back and says, look, can you give him his personal stuff back? Because that was illegally seized. And the judge agreed and said, yes, you give it back. That was illegally seized. Well, when it came up to trial, then his attorney said, well, hold up. If that was illegally seized, then so was the evidence that you took that you're trying to use in this trial. And at the trial, he was, I take it back. He didn't raise that argument at trial. He goes to trial. He's convicted. He's sentenced to jail. He appeals all the way to the Supreme Court. And at that point is when the court said, well, hold up. If the, if the personal items were taken illegally, then the other stuff was taken illegally. And this formed the basis, this case formed the basis of what is known as the exclusionary rule. And what the exclusionary rule says, evidence illegally seized by the police cannot be used in a trial. All right, that's the rule from it. Evidence illegally seized. So if you are filling out your piece of paper then you might want to put exclusionary rule for the feds because this only applied to federal officers. Mr. Weeks's case involved U.S. officers, um, not um, not states. Didn't apply to the states yet. Remember, we have different levels of of governance and different levels of enforcement. So under Weeks versus U.S., this was the exclusionary rule for the feds. All right. By 1920, not, not too far behind that, we have another landmark case that comes through, and it's the Silverthorne Lumber case. And the Silverthorne Lumber case, so Mr. Silverthorne and his father operated this lumber company, and they were in tax trouble with the IRS. So federal agents detained them and got them on a single criminal count while they were being detained by these agents, other agents entered their office without a warrant, seized some company documents and financial books. And um, they wanted to get that stuff back. Um, but the problem that we have in this one is that we got different levels of enforcement that kicked into play. So they get they when they're released, Mr. Silverthorne asked the court for the return of his illegally seized documents. The district attorney objected, saying, well, hold up. When we looked at those documents, we found more stuff to charge them for. So the bottom line is you took the documents illegally based on this one charge, and while you're looking at that evidence, you found more stuff. And the court came back and said, mm, I'm sorry, evidence that comes from an illegal seizure cannot be used at trial. So let's look at the different levels here. And by the way, the Silverthorn case stands for fruit of the poisonous tree. So you might want to put that on your form, fruit of the poisonous tree. Fruit of the poisonous tree you're going to see is basically a step further from the Weeks exclusionary rule. So if you take it illegally, it can't be used. Fruit of the poisonous tree says if you take it illegally and it leads you to something else, that something else can't be used either. All right. So fruit of the poisonous tree, meaning that the tree itself is poison and it was poison when you illegally seized it. So now anything that comes from that tree also is not going to be allowed to be used in court.
by 1961, and that's a pretty big jump now. Remember, we just went from 1920 up to 1961. But Mapp versus Ohio is the case that applied the exclusionary rule to the states. Remember when we talked about weeks um, versus U.S., which was the exclusionary rule, we said that was for the federal agents. 1961, Mapp versus Ohio, again, what you'll put for number three, Mapp versus Ohio, that applied the exclusionary rule to the states as well. So now all your state police officers and your local police officers are all subject to the same rule. If it's illegally seized, it's not going to be used at trial. Okay, so we're going to step out now and kind of go a little further, and that is what about searches that are conducted incident to arrest? So there you go, the police officer goes to arrest somebody. What can he search while he's making that arrest? Well, in 1969, the I guess it's Schimmel or Chimmel case in California, um, the officers here tried to, to, to say that they did a search incident to arrest. They went to Mr. Chimmel's home. They had an arrest warrant, okay, an arrest warrant. So they took him into custody. So he's sitting out in the police car and they go in and search his home and they claimed it was necessary for them to search his home as part of the arrest process and to keep the officer safe. And the Supreme Court came back and said, nope, that's not the way this works. Your search for the, the safety of police and the public and all is limited to the suspect. You can search him and make sure he's not armed and the area in his immediate control. So when you took him and put him out in the police car, detained, you can't go search that house. There, he's no, there's no risk to safety there. Um, if it's not something that he can immediately put his hands on, reach and grab, you should not be searching it. So it limited the suspect to, um, I'm sorry, limited the search to the suspect and the area in his control. Um, again, on your document, you may want to just put, you know, set the rules on search incident to arrest or this last sentence here, this, it limited the search to the suspect in the area in his control. Now, the Burger Court and the Rehnquist Court, both of them um, were more conservative and they came up with a couple of, I guess you might want to call them exceptions. Um, they they kind of they backed off these initially strict decisions that came from the Warren court. You know, absolutely, if you illegally search something, that evidence is out, not going to be used. Well, well, the Berger court and the Rehnquist court, they're going to come back and start chipping away at that a little bit. And one of the first cases that they did um, to chip away at it was uh, U.S. versus Leon, and this is in 1984. So Mr. Leon was placed under surveillance for doing some drug trafficking. And based on that information, they applied, the police officers applied to the courts for a search warrant. And the search warrant, they submitted a written affidavit. And that's the way that still works today. They submit a written affidavit to the judge. The judge determines whether there is probable cause um, and grants the warrant, right? So they did this in Mr. Leon's case. They searched his residence and they found drugs. But he, and actually he was convicted. But remember, we're going up the ladder to get to the U.S. Supreme Court. The federal district court, which when we get to courts, we'll study the levels, but that's, you're, you're starting down lower now. We're not to the Supreme Court yet went back and looked at the affidavit and said, well, this didn't really establish probable cause. So that warrant should have never been issued. So therefore you have an illegal search, right? And the US court at the time, the US Supreme Court said, time out. Those officers that conducted that search, they did everything they were told to do. They submitted their affidavit and their information to the judge the judge granted their warrant. They went in with their warrant and they found the drugs. It's not their fault that something was deficient in the work the judge did, right? 
th they established what is called a good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. So if those officers seized the evidence in good faith, it can still be used in court. Even if down the road, the search is later ruled illegal because the warrant shouldn't have issued. So think about that. It is an exception. They did everything they were supposed to do, but later on it was determined you really shouldn't have had a search warrant signed by that judge, but you acted in good faith. You did everything the way you were supposed to do it. So everything's good there. The good faith exception. There's another case, Massachusetts versus Shepard, that are, that's um, said basically the same thing. I don't think it's on your list of cases. Oh yeah, U.S. versus Leon is, that's number E. Massachusetts versus Shepard, I don't think it isn't because it was the, basically the same thing. But on that one, that's E, the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. That's what U.S. versus Leon stood for, good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. So Harris versus U.S. Now we're going to get into... Um, what's referred to as the plain view doctrine. And what the plain view doctrine says is officers can go ahead and seize evidence that's in plain view without even a warrant. So the U.S. versus Harris case in 1968, they had um, impounded a vehicle and arrested a defendant and impounding, meaning, you know, they tow the vehicle to the police yard and the officer was cleaning out the vehicle and he discovered evidence of a robbery. And um, they tried to argue, Mr. Harris tried to argue that you didn't have the right to go in my car. You didn't have a warrant to go in my car. And the courts in this one came back and said, no, that was out in open. We had to go in and secure the car. It's in our it's in our care. We have to make sure that it's secure. Nobody's going to take anything. So we had to open the door and check the inside of the car. And when we did, we saw this evidence out right laying right out there in the plain view. Didn't have to go digging for it anywhere. And so the Harris versus U.S. That's F under number one. It created the plain view um, doctrine. And plain view, meaning you don't need a warrant if you have something just laying right out in plain view. All right. Um, Horton versus California. So in this one, you know, it, it, it seemed to everybody once Harris came out for a long time that it had to be kind of an inadvertent, oh, look what's laying out in plain view. Um, you know, it has, to, it has to be kind of a, I stumbled over this. Well, Horton versus California, now that we're all the way up to 1990 now, in this case, they said, no, it doesn't have to be uh, inadvertent. So the warrant was, in this case, to search for jewelry. And the affidavit that was submitted to get the warrant also included some language about, um, let me back up. The police officers knew that they there, there should be a, 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 an Uzi submachine gun and a, um, I can't even read my other, the other item that it was supposed to be there. There was a couple of things they knew about they mentioned them in the affidavit, but they did not come back and list them in the warrant. So let's see. A warrant was issued authorizing the search of Terry Bryce Horton's home for stolen jewelry. The affidavit completed by the officer who requested the warrant alluded to an Uzi submachine gun and a stun gun, weapons that were purportedly used in the jewelry robbery. It did not request that those weapons be listed on the search warrant. So the officer searched the defendant's home and they didn't find the stolen jewelry, but they did find a number of weapons, among them an Uzi, two stun guns and a 38 caliber revolver. He was convicted of robbery in a trial in which the seized weapons were introduced into evidence. 
He appealed his conviction, claiming the officers had reason to believe the weapons were in his home at the time of the search, and therefore they were not seized inadvertently. And the court said, it doesn't have to be inadvertent. Um, it's That's not a condition necessary to ensure that um, you know, the seizure is legitimate. Mr. Mr. Horton's point had been, you know, they knew about the guns. They should have listed that specifically on the the um, search warrant, but they didn't. Um, now, you know, the plain view doctrine seems it seems so you kind of get it when, you know, you walk through the home or you just saw something in the car or whatever. But where it really presents some issues is with um, computers. Because what's in plain view when you're looking at a computer? So what if you're, um, you know, you you the police sees your computer because they think that you've been involved in fraud, and while they're looking for that evidence of the fraud, they stumble across some stolen videos, some pirated videos that you weren't supposed to have. Was that plain view? on a computer. So that's a that's a whole different issue, but it just goes to show you that these things can get pretty complicated when you start talking about the rules on searches and seizures. All right, what about emergency searches? So sometimes uh, certain emergencies might justify an officer's decision to go ahead and search without a warrant. Um, Warden versus Hayden, um, it's not on your list right here, but in that one, an armed robber fled the scene and fled into a building and the police chased him into the building. Well, remember when police go into a building, they're supposed to have a warrant, right? And in that situation, the court said, now this is back in 67, the court says, uh-uh, no, that was an emergency. They, you had to go in and get that guy. You were okay with going into that building without stopping to get a warrant. Another one was the Brigham City versus Stewart. Um, so in the Brigham City case, that one, there was a fight. Uh, they entered into a, I think this is the one um, that it, they could see through the blinds and see a fight was going on so they just busted up in there to bust up the fight and they you know the the defendant tried to argue that you didn't have any right to come in that home you didn't have a warrant and the court came back and said no no there are some emergency warrantless entry situations this is dire situations and they entered in there to break up the fight to protect human life so that was just another example. That one's not even on your list, but just to understand that there are some emergency circumstances. What makes up the emergency? Well, if there's a clear danger to life that the person might escape or that evidence might be removed or destroyed. So that's the um, that's basically the FBI's um Definition, I guess you would say, of when a warrantless search um, would be allowed, clear danger to life, escape, or the destruction of evidence. Wilson versus Arkansas. Uh, this is, again, showing one of these types of emergency um, searches or entries that's allowed. This is in Arkansas. And there was a drug dealer who was flushing drugs down the toilet as their you know, trying to get into the home. And the Wilson versus Arkansas came out and said, you know, police officers in general should be knocking and announcing their identity. Um, and if you're like me and you watch all these crime shows on TV, I've always wondered why you're busting up in there to get the bad guy and you're going to knock, you know, NCIS, federal agent. It's like, why are you knocking and saying who you are? Well, because there's law that says they are supposed to do that. That is the general requirement is that they knock and announce their identity. But even a little, just within two years, look at the dates on these cases. In Richards versus Wisconsin, they said, "Yeah, but you are going to have situations where, nope, there's you don't mm -mm, you don't have to knock if that knocking or announcing would be dangerous or futile or inhibit the investigation." So no knock when we and if you um, remember the first class and I showed the little video on Brianna Stewart. 
That was a what they called a no-knock warrant. And that's what that means is they did not have to knock and announce themselves. And the reason being, because they thought it fit within one of these situations. Um, another type of warrant is what we call an anticipatory warrant. Um, that's from the word anticipate. And if you know what anticipate means, it's you expect something to happen. I'm anticipating that it's going to rain, you know, if it's very cloudy, um, I'm, I'm anticipating that happening. So there are certain situations when a warrant can be issued in anticipation of something else. So a warrant that's anticipating the president presence of evidence that it's not yet there, but you still need the warrant. And so this case, and this one is on your list. I'm sorry, I might've skipped over a couple, but um, the G Wilson versus Arkansas was the officer should knock. H US versus Grubbs is the one we're looking at now. And that is for anticipatory warrants. So in the US versus Grubbs case, um, that's the one where they said, look, this package of kitty porn is going to arrive on this guy's doorstep. And as soon as it arrives, then we need the warrant to go in and get the evidence. And the court did issue that warrant. So you see the difference here? I need a warrant that says I can go into this home, but I'm not going to go in until I know the package got delivered. So they're anticipating the evidence showing up. And then as soon as it does, they can go in. So that's an anticipatory warrant. And the court said that's okay if there is probable cause that evidence of the crime will be on the premises when the warrant is executed. So you got to have all three things, probable cause that the evidence is going to be there by the time the warrant is acted upon. So U.S. versus Grubbs, that's for um, anticipatory warrants. And the Herring versus U.S., now look at the date. Now we're getting much more, you know, later in time. Um, this is even chipping away more at the exclusionary rule. Now think about where we have come from. We have come from exclusionary rule, illegal search, evidence out. Then we chipped away and said, well, if the officers did everything they were supposed to do, we have this good faith exception. Now we're going to say the exclusionary rule does not apply when officers acted in good faith. We kind of already had that. And it should only be used as a last resort. And only if intentional or reckless violation of the Fourth Amendment. Now, look at that language, y'all. We have come from you did it wrong, evidence excluded, all the way up to, ah, well, you did it wrong, but you thought you were doing right. And it really wasn't an intentional or reckless violation of the rights. So we're going to make this discretionary thing to see if the violation was bad enough to even use the exclusionary rule. And, and that's just an example of, um, and, and look, this is, I didn't point this out, but if you see the PowerPoint here, guess what court we're up to now? The John Roberts court. Guess who's the chief justice of the Supreme Court? John Roberts. Like this is your day and age. This is your time, the John Roberts court. Now this is still back in 09, so it's still a few years back. But that's how far the court came. And if you think about what we said from day one, criminal justice is all about balancing the individual's rights versus the good of the public. Okay. We've said that from day one. This is where this is why whenever there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, it becomes a big freaking deal because the president gets to put somebody up for that spot. They're confirmed by the Senate, but the president is the one that nominates that, that judge to be on the Supreme Court. The president, of course, is part of a political party and that political party has certain beliefs on some of these rights. So if that president believes that individual rights are more important, then all of these landmark decisions are gonna lean more towards individual rights. If the president nominates somebody who gets put on, who's much more of a, Oh, no, the public good. We don't care about these bad criminal people. We're not going to protect their rights. 
well, then those landmark cases are going to chip away at those rules that were set. So that's where we are. Now we've gone all the way from the earlier court that said, look, individual rights are first. If you don't follow the rules, the evidence is excluded. We have moved all the way over to, eh, well, you know, they acted in good faith. This exclusionary thing, that should be a last resort. Only if the conduct of those officers was so bad as to be classified as intentional or reckless. That's a big sweep. And that's that's because this court or, you know, in 09, it's been some changes since 09, surely. But in 09, they were leaning more towards public policy, public order, public safety, way more important than the individual's rights. Okay, I'm going to um, go ahead and stop there. I'm going to try to break chapter seven down into a couple of different pieces. I may, I've said I'm going to do it in two. I may do it in three even. We're going to see. Uh, I do want to go back over your sheet real quick with you to make sure you got the notes. I know y'all can play this back, but let's just make sure. Weeks versus U.S. was the exclusionary rule for feds. The silver thorn lumber, that was fruit of the poisonous tree. Remember, we take that exclusionary rule, says all the evidence is prohibited. Um, fruit of the poisonous tree says, well, not only is that evidence prohibited, but if you use that evidence and found something else, then that other something else is prohibited as well. MAP versus Ohio is what took that Weeks case that created exclusionary and applied it to the states as well. Chamel versus California, that was the one that set the rules on the search incident to arrest. You should not be searching. Um, if you're saying it's, in a, it's tied in with the arrest, then it should only be him and the area in his immediate control. U.S. versus Leon, that was the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. That's the one where the officers did what they were supposed to do, but come to find out on the back end of the case, the, prob the there really wasn't probable cause for that judge to issue the warrant. But because the officers acted in good faith, they went ahead and let that evidence in. Harris versus U.S. is the one that created the plain view document. If you just open the door and the evidence is laying right there, didn't need a warrant to get it. Wilson versus Arkansas is the one that said, in general, officers should knock and announce themselves before they go in. Harris, I'm sorry, U.S. versus Grubbs, that's anticipatory warrants. Remember, probable cause that the evidence is going to be there when this warrant is executed. That's, that's our uh, child pornography guy who we're sitting out watching his house, waiting for the package to arrive. Once the package arrives, he takes it inside. Then we execute the warrant and go inside. And the Herring versus U.S. is the last one on the list. We just did that. That's the one that said the exclusionary rule is used as a last resort and only if intentional and reckless police violation. All right. So that gets you through all of the cases on search and seizure. My next tape, when I get it done, we're going to break that down. Remember, we, we started this. If you look back at the beginning of this PowerPoint, we said really these constitutional issues apply to three areas for police in general. These are the main three areas. The search and seizure, that's what we just did. The arrest, that's going to come next. And we're going to look at cases that deal with arrest. And then um, the interrogation. And interrogation is the questioning that the officers do of the, you know, the, the potential defendant or de and that's we don't know if he's a defendant yet. Um, we don't know if he's a suspect yet. That's going to make a determination in some of those cases. So I'll leave you with that. So I've posted chapter six. I will post this beginning of chapter seven. I'm going to come back and follow up with either one or two more pieces of chapter seven. And um, that's going to take us through. Uh, next week. So that's why I'm not rushing through to get it all posted because between this week that we're in and next week, then we're going to do six and seven. And I will bump the timing of those questions back. I've already bumped, I think, chapter six's review questions back the date they were due because I was late in posting the tape. So I hope y'all have a great Mardi Gras. I know you get a couple of days off. That's why I'm going to try to build in some extra days here so you can actually take those days off. And then we'll come back and finish it up. And then it's almost time for us to have some um, interviews with some real police officers to see what it's really like. All right. Y'all stay safe, too.